O heavenly King, comfort to the spirit of truth, who art in all places and fills all things, treasure of good things and giver of life, come and dwell in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Ayyuha al-Malik al-Samawi al-Mu'azzi ruh al-Haq al-Hadr fi kulli ma'kan wa suq'an wa al-Mali al-Kul kanzu al-Salihat wa razaq al-Hayat haluma wasqum fina wa tahrna min kulli danasin wa khalis ayyuha al-Salih nufusina. Ameen. Well, welcome back. Uh, well, welcome back. Well, uh, welcome again and welcome back to me. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, as you know, I was at the village for two weeks. They were a beautiful two weeks. I felt I was in heaven and then just now came back to earth again. You know, it's just, uh, it's just a beautiful place to be at. We've been with the kids. Uh, we had at least um, the session, session four, that I was uh, one of the two session priests uh, for. We had f- four children, uh, four from our uh, church, two in the, the first one, uh, the 4A, and then two from 4B session. Um, I know Sophia went, uh, Fehuri went uh, session three. I don't remember if it was A or B. And who uh, else? Two went to Sada Gabuna. Oh, session, session two. Yes, two, session two, two A. Two A. a. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Um, God willing. I'm he had Father to... Belcher. Okay, yeah, so he says, yes. Um, um, looking forward, you know, to it next year, too. Uh, God willing, we'll try to see if we can have a bunch of our kids can go in the same session. And hopefully by next year with more, um, uh, you know, more control, like controlling more of the pandemic thing and the COVID, we're able to, exp- you know, have uh, the you know, a full session. Uh, this year, they had to divide every session to two sessions because they were limited in number uh, due to the pandemic. And they had to basically divide it. And then like, instead of one session, uh, 300 something kids or 200 something kid, they had to do four session, but each session A and B uh, and each basically um, around a hundred kids. The last one, 4B was, 50 something kids only anyway looking forward for next year to this and having a great greater number from our church going together will be nice inshallah inshallah exactly um tonight well first i want to thank deacon nicola for stepping up those past two weeks and leading the the sessions uh last week um this week we do we are going to talk about the um it's actually we're starting the second book uh, um, the second book, and we're starting with church building. But in it, in the church building, we actually, if you notice, we talk about the church building in general, but also the altar table. We talk about the what's called the oblation table, the prothesis where uh, we prepare the priest prepare the uh, you know the lamb. We prepare the bread and the wine uh, in the morning before. Uh, before uh, you know communion um, we will talk about what's called the iconostasis the wall of icon the one that separates where the people stands and the people in the altar in the altar and then we'll talk about the vestments of the especially of the priest just a, a small like uh, introduction to them or like a general uh, overview and then uh, some of the christian symbols what they mean and what we usually see okay um, in the beginning, I do have, if you don't mind me, uh, Angela, I don't know if I can't share yet, but okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I do want to share just, um, just, uh, <clears throat> sometimes visuals are good. Uh, this one, we're going to start with the church. This is a very, literally, if you Google Orthodox church building, this is one of the first pictures that actually you see. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, uh, just again, all of these, like as you notice in the book, they're just general information, they're just like an overview and kind of like step one to learn different things, how we have them in the church. Um, of course, keep in mind, not every single church looks exactly, exactly like the other but they all have a lot of things in common. Like it cannot be a church and you're in Orthodox church and say, well, there's no altar in this Orthodox church. Like, no, it should be an altar, but the shape of this altar might be different from one church to another. As you might notice at our church, comparing it to other churches or comparing all these other churches to a bunch of other churches. Um, 
but let's see with the book so when um, the book starts talking about the church building it says in the long history of the orthodox church a definite style of church architecture has developed okay this style is characterized by the attempt to reveal the fundamental experience of orthodox christianity uh, god is with us uh, God is with man in Christ through the Holy Spirit. The dwelling place of God is with men. Um, Orthodox Church architecture reveals that God is with men, dwelling in them and living in them through Christ and the Spirit. Okay, so we know at the end of the day, the temple, the church um, uh, in Orthodox Christianity is each one of us, our bodies. And that's why we have the account of Christ saying that I will destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days, not definitely meaning, and the, the Jews misunderstood him big time. They thought he was referring to their actual building, the Jewish temple, but he was actually talking about the body, that he's going to renew the body. And in the end of the day, God abides or should primarily abide in us. We are the best temple. But as humans, we like to touch and we need to see and we need to smell and it, we need to feel. We need that place, a specific place that we feel like somehow more connected to Christ, more connected to God. And that's why we have the church building. We have this, you know, set aside place where we go to and we feel, as I keep reading, that we are in heaven, actually, or what is foreshadowing the what's going to be our life in the next life, in the real life, in the eternal life. Okay. Um, when we notice something very important in the church, that uh, um, again, I'll repeat the last point, and then I'll jump to the next one. Orthodox Church architecture reveals that God is with men, dwelling in them and living in them through Christ and the Spirit. It does so by using the dome or the vaulted ceiling to crown the Christian church building, the house of the church, which is the people of God. Unlike the pointed arches, which point to God far up in the heavens, the dome or the spacious all-embracing ceiling gives the impression that in the kingdom of God and in the church, Christ unites all things in himself, things in heaven and things on earth, and that in him we are all filled with the fullness of God. So when we talk about the dome, you can see here on the screen, this kind of like, this kind of uh, um, uh, like the dome that you see it usually uh, right in the middle or like right outside, like kind of in the middle between the nave um, uh, and the altar. If I go in here, I can show you just in general. Let me just say that's not that's for another one. Maybe this one like this. So like I told you, this is one of the very common pictures always shows up. So you always see in the churches. Um, you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Um, the dome, you know, domes domes, domes, and this kind of like, uh, this is actually St. Mary's uh, in Baltimore, but you'll see the church either a huge dome and then small ones around it or a bunch of small ones, but usually you always have, or even when it's pointy, and I can talk a little bit more about the pointy, um, why we have, because our church has no dome, right? We don't have a dome. We actually have this kind of like pointy ceiling, which Technically, it is not. You would never see an Orthodox church in the old country, which this kind of like uh, pointy, either flat or if it's a little bit like kind of curvy or uh, like a, a, a full dome, uh, basically. And um, in like, why do we see like this picture that we see here? It's like pointy, but also... Uh, 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 you know, it has the domes, and that's that's a personal uh, um, uh, opinion. I don't. I mean, I never like um, uh, authenticated it, if I, I can say. But this is like the Protestant. Uh, uh, um, um, that's the Protestant uh, um, mentality uh, that our 
a church like God is somehow too far from us and we're not worthy. And it's just like somehow, it's just like hard to reach. And it's not like, it doesn't seem like it's encompassing that as Orthodox. But the reasons like we've, you know, a lot of our churches, not only St. George and Washington, D.C., we have a lot of churches, Greek churches, Russian churches, uh, some Russian churches and a lot of Antiochian churches are like this because especially the ones that they were built in the 40s, 50s, 60s, in some of the 70s. And one of the thing is, one of the reasons um, they didn't know better in a way that they didn't find architecture can, you know, do or familiar with Byzantine ar architecture. Uh, and also there was this fear that it's somehow, there's this misconception that domes, we took this kind of architecture from Islam and that's not true. Uh, it is not true because Jewish, first of all, the Jewish, we took it from the Jewish um, the practice. And then the, the Islam took it from us and the Jews, basically. And I'll give you an example. In 1978, uh, my home parish church was built uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, in West Roxbury. It's a town right outside of Boston. Um, when Metropolitan Philip of Thrice Blessed Memory came to consecrate the church, he looked at them and says, where's the dome? And they're like, oh, no dome. We didn't make it. We didn't build a dome. And he's like, what do you mean you didn't build a dome? It was literally like a flat, flat, you know, flat roof. And, and the people in church, they were like, no, no, no. This is so Muslim. We don't want people to miss, um, miss, you know, understand or have the miss uh, understanding that it's. Uh, and he's like, well, I'm not coming back. I'm leaving. I'm not going. I'm not going to consecrate uh, consecrate the church till you put a dome on it. And they literally had to open like the ceiling and the dome now at St. George in West Roxbury, Massachusetts, in a very awkward place where you're not used, you know, you don't see it where, like, it's not where it should be, but that was the only place that they can put it because of the construction, the way it's constructed. The point is, at the end of the day, uh, in general, churches should, should have some kind of a dome or at least some kind of a flat, but it's like the whole point, it is just to encompass the people in there. And we don't want to show that somehow God is very far to reach. And in the, mid, in, in, the, in the middle of the dome, as we see in this picture, there is an icon of who? Christ. There is always, and it's called the Almighty Lord, al or the Almighty One. Uh, Pandocrat, or the one who just like has everything under his control and looking at us from up there. Okay, so that's uh, basically uh, um, uh, the the you know um, one of the main uh, 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 characteristics of a of an Orthodox church is having the dome. Uh, the shape of the church, it it. it it depends. You might have a flat uh, wall, uh, um, roof, um, especially old ones. Uh, you might see is if it's like very, very old one. But then the more developed churches, they might have the shape of a cross. See how this one looks like kind of a cross uh, with the corners here and here. Some might have, don't have the shape of a cross, but it's literally just the whole thing. It's just like a like a half circle. And it represents actually Noah's Ark and it added the dome added to like somewhere in the middle, like toward like the, uh, um, uh, the altar. Or as you see here, it's just like kind of like this dome starts right at where the wall of icons is. Um, but in the end of the day, again, the most important temple, the most important church is in our um, it's in us, but we definitely need that building also to set aside that time and place where we worship God together also as a community. Um, any questions about, you know, at least when it comes to the building itself? Yeah, actually, yeah, I do have a question. Yes, ma'am, hit me. Um, where it says the royal doors has the beautiful gates, has the, royal, has the beautiful gates been used the royal doors interchangeably? So, so technically, that's the royal doors uh, initially, and this is only the beautiful gate cult. And the reason, because usually you should have, on every church should have two doors, at least two doors. One main one in the back, and one side ones, or two side ones, or three side ones, whatever. 
And the one here, the one, let's say, where people enter our church from, it's called the royal doors because only the emperor before used to enter this. Hmm. And if not the, the, the emperor, the bishop. And people, the, the lay people, will always step in from or enter the church from the side doors. So technically, we should have some kind of a door here or some kind of a door here. Uh, be, like when you look at old churches, big churches, you always have those side doors and then uh, um, the main door. In this one, it's called the uh, uh, the beautiful gate, just the beautiful gate. But nowadays, because we don't have emperors anymore, uh, we called it, we, we keep call it, I mean, now we call it kind of, so we use that term royal doors and the royal gate interchangeably. Okay, that's, that's how I've heard it before. Okay, so you would hear this one. Babel Haikel, or where we enter to the where the priest and the bishop only go in and out from this. Nowadays, it's called the you know the royal gate or the royal door, uh, and but initially it is always named as the um, the beautiful gate, literally, and that's what the Greek name of it, um, the beautiful beautiful gate. Okay, any other questions? And. Um, I'll just try to follow. I don't want to just talk in general about it. I just, because I want to still give, you know, follow what the book uh, is basically, um, you know, the way the book is going. Um, the church building is patterned after the image of God's kingdom in the book of Revelation. And we'll hear more about this next week with Father Damaskinos, uh, because the whole thing, this whole scenery, that whatever the priest is doing in the altar and the people here worshiping, that's basically what our life is going to be, like our constant life, you know, is going to be uh, just worshiping this kind of offering, this divine liturgy, technically, daily, you know, to, uh, to our God. Um, before us in the altar, uh, before us is the altar table on which Christ is enthroned, the, the altar table right here. Let me see. We can. Here we go. That's the altar table at our church, of course. And this is where everything, basically, the priest does the work. He starts on this side here, but of course, everything in the end starts here and ends here. Um, before us is the altar table on which Christ is enthroned, both as the Word of God in the Gospels and as the Lamb of God in the Eucharistic sacrifice. The throne of God, if you notice, there's the church here, um, there's the chair there, and there's a, re I mean, we put it as if this is the throne of God, although, of course, no one sits there except the priest or the bishop, but it, in a way, it's just a representative thing that this is the throne of God here. Uh, in other churches, you might see a main chair in the middle like a bigger chair and then future chairs around it on either side like a smaller kind of size as if like god and then his apostle disciples you know um but around the table are the angels and saints okay what we mean is usually also you would never see an authentic uh traditional orthodox church without iconography everywhere like everywhere even when you go in the old country um even or you go to greece or uh, any places if they're they're old churches and we're talking since like fifth sixth century usually they're all like filled with iconography there's no place just it's not just like you're hanging an icon it's literally drawing icons on the walls everywhere it will be in the altar everywhere and we'll talk a little bit about that but um uh Basically, around the table are the angels and saints, the servants of the word and the lamb who glorify him. And of course, around the table, meaning the angels and the saints, now the priest, the deacons, the bishop who worship here and prepare uh, the, the lamb. Um, uh, and through him, God the Father is in the perpet perpetual adoration inspired by the Holy Spirit. The faithful Christians on earth who already belong to that holy assembly fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, as it says in Ephesians, enter into the eternal worship of God's kingdom in the church. Thus, in, in the Orthodox practice, the vestibule symbolizes this world. If you notice, there is this part, like the narthex, which before in the old days where they used to get ready, instead of now, we get ready like on the altar as priests and bishops, we kind of like get ready on a side room around the altar. But in the old days, they used to uh, get ready somewhere here. 
and there is this like narthex, the place we call narthex is just like, so we don't step right away from the outside to the inside right away. And sometimes this is like a, uh, a, like a, um, uh, a place just to like to get us ready to get to go in into the main part of the church. Uh, and actually this part, the narthex, we're also uh, the catechumens, the people who are uh, not fully, I mean, they're not baptized yet. At some point when they start here, they go out and they wait in this area. And that's why you might see some chairs because this is where they wait till the end of the liturgy. Uh, and then, or outside nowadays, you know, but the point is, it was this kind of place, the North is the place like kind of like step one, just like to get you like situated between the outside world and the heavenly world. And this is where, but in our days now, it's like where we light the candle, we kind of like make whatever our donations, we kiss the icons, and then we make our place to the nave. This is where the people sit. I mean, here you don't see pews, but technically we can have pews here. Um, and then, of course, you have those like couple steps up, like we have at our church. And then we have what's called the altar, right? So this is the uh, narthex, the nave where the people sit, and then the altar. So we have those kind of three major places in the church, the narthex, the nave, and the sanctuary or the altar. Um, again, in some churches, this might be a big, big room. Some churches, they have a very small room, barely, you know, just very small room to, you know, to get you situated. Um, and all, all of these depends on the size, size of the church, you know, and stuff like this. Um, the nave is the place of the church understood as the assembly and people of God. The altar area called the sanctuary or the holy place stands for the kingdom of God. Okay, so the way we see it, this is where the people are, you know, sit or stand in, in prayers. And there's this other place, kind of higher place, kind of this holier place is where actually the, the throne of God, where God is basically seated and we're around him, worshiping him and praying for him. Any questions about this? We can go into more details. We don't, I mean, this is like the bishop's throne. Back in the old days, that was not the bishop's throne. The bishop's throne would have been here in the back, where technically the, the throne of God, and that was for the emperor. So a lot of churches did not have that throne because it has only been where the, usually the emperor goes and worship, uh, or you know, usually the emperor. Uh, but after the fall of Constantinople, where we don't have a Byzantine empire, or like we are the Christian empire, if I can say, um, the bishop resumed both political and religious leadership in a way, uh, at least during the Ottoman Empire. Um, so that's why the throne outside, the bishop starts by standing here and then goes and makes his way to the other throne later during the liturgy. Um, traditional churches always have two choir stands on either side, the right choir and the left choir, okay? That's also something traditional. Nowadays, we don't have that much of this. Usually it's either one here or one on this side, or we have what's called the choir loft. But the choir loft and all of this, this is just a, this is a, if I can say, a new product, if I can say, that is not very traditional. Usually choirs always been situated somewhere on the side, on the front here. And they might be in older churches, they might be on a higher place here. There's like a, literally steps that take you up and then you're standing here, especially in Hagia Sophia, if you've been there, uh, you have a couple of places where people used to, you know, stand on, you know, it's like a bunch of stairs and what's called the ambo. Literally the ambo is like the place you, you know, you stand on and then you can pray and like chant so people can hear you because of course there were no, um, uh, microphones or anything like to help project the voice and the sound. Um, that's basically as like a church building just in general. Uh, the next one, we're going to talk about the altar table, okay? As you see, this is the altar table at St. George. I just took these pictures uh, yesterday when I was there. I uh, just wanted at least, you know, at least to see, you know, the things that we have at our church. Uh, the entire church building is centered around the altar table. This is the most important place for us here. 
this is the, the place for us. Uh, the altar table does not merely symbolizes, uh, does not merely symbolize, that's not what I wanted, but that's okay. Uh, we, uh, the table of the Last Supper, uh, it is the symbolic and mystical presence of the heavenly throne and table of the kingdom of God, the, the table of Christ the Word, the Lamb and the King of the everlasting life of God's glorified dominion over all creation. The point is, at the end of the day, this is the most important and most blessed and the center of everything we do. This is it, this kind of table here, because this is where we prepared the gifts. Um, the book of the gospel. Uh, where's the other picture? We can use this one for now. The book of the gospel is perpetually enthroned on the altar table and from the altar table we receive the bread of life the body and blood of the lord's uh, passover supper this table is the table of god's kingdom always the gospels here right and then you know and we'll talk about this red cloth in a minute but always always there's no church that you're going to go to just it's not going to have a gospel book it's just that, that's just like unheard of you know what i mean like it just can't you always, always have to have the gospel book in here. Um, and it's only the four gospels, just the four gospels of, you know, Matthew, Mark. Um, um, well, those are the, uh, actually, um, those are the prophets on the other side. Uh, but basically the book is only for the four gospels that read every, um, you know, that we read every Sunday. So no Acts of the Apostles, no Old Testament, and no, uh, epistles or anything like this just the four gospels divided also according to order of sundays in order of feast and stuff like this they, you know in the book uh, in orthodox tradition the altar table is often carved wood or stone so our church is different just the way they built it but usually this is either carved wood and like or stones. Um, it is usually vested with colorful material to show its divine and heavenly character. And that's why we see the yellow because yellow represent gold. Gold means, you know, kingship, all of, you know, these things um, uh, being, you know, precious, expensive. During Lent, what we do, we put purple because it also represents, um, you know, God the king, but also there is some kind of sadness in it. Um, red when it's Pascha, when it's, I'm sorry, when it's uh, uh, Christmas. White when it's uh, Pascha, Easter. So that's what it means that we something we cover it with something. Um, it is usually vested with colorful material to show its divine and heavenly character. It should always be a simple temp a table of proportional dimensions, often a perfect cube and is always freestanding. So it may be encircled. You're not going to see like, it's always usually this simple, that simple. Let me, you know what I mean? Just like boom, boom, square. And what you notice here, this is a very kind of like, I keep, I keep it very kind of traditional. Those what we need to have, this is what we have. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. We need to have the cross. We need to have the gospel. And usually we just cover it just so it's a tradition that we cover it from the old days. Just nothing drops on, like, just to keep it clean. Dust and everything, just we, uh, we clean it. And we'll talk about this one, this part here in a second and why I have the candle in here. Um, on the altar table, one always finds the entimension. The entimension is this, this thing. So, uh, so did you see this red cloth here? This red thing like under the gospel. So during the liturgy, during after the great entrance, or at, right, actually at the reading of the epistle, I move the gospel and I stand it right here. I don't know if it's, sometimes you might see it from the out, you know, from where you're standing. I make it, I stand it up right here. And then I open this red cloth. When I open this red cloth, that's what you, what you, what's on it. Okay. And this is what's called, and it's a Greek word that means uh, it's called uh, endimension. Uh, endimension is a Greek word, literally means instead of the table, literally instead of the table. That's a word, the Greek word. In it, this is the most important piece also in the liturgy. Uh, you might see it in different colors. You might see it black and white, 
but it's you might see it a little bit different, but it's the same icon in a way, which is taking Christ out of the uh, from the uh, uh, from the cross. And in it here, if you notice, the noble there's the hymn from Holy Friday, the noble Joseph taking um, thy body, thy most pure body from the tree. Here we go. Just let me make it a little bit bigger. Uh, can make it bigger like this. Yeah. Uh, wrapped it in clean linen and sweet spices, and then it continues also uh, here, and laid it in a new tomb. Okay, that's actually the, the hymn that we chant uh, on Holy Thursday, uh, Holy Friday. But also in the bottom, you're always going to have that kind of writing. Except this holy entomance was consecrated by the servant of God, and whoever is the metropolitan of the area. So our metropolitan is Joseph. This is what his, has his, his signature on it. Before Sayyidina Joseph, we had Sayyidina Philip. We had a different one with his name here, with his signature here. Okay, metropolitan of the Antiochian Archdiocese of all North America. And he just added the day he was enthroned, the third day of June, of July in the year 2014. Okay, this, I'll talk about it now in a second. I mean, I keep talking about in I'll mention this, this kind of sponge here in a second also, I'll talk about it. So on the altar table, one always finds the endimensio. This is the cloth depicting Christ in the tomb, which contains the signature of the bishop and is the permission for the local community to gather as the church. A church that does not receive an endimens, that means it is not approved by the, its archdiocese. I cannot just show up. So technically the point is, I can't just like go now I don't know, some house or build my own church and start worshiping there. That doesn't mean anything for us, for me, or for the church itself, because this is basically, this is the deed, if I can say, you know, this is the deed that I own, this, or this place is acknowledged, or this place exists, uh, or it has authenticity, right? So what do I mean by this? Let's say now we say, oh, we have to start a mission somewhere. Like that's what usually happens. Or we need to start a mission at somebody's house or in some room that we're going to rent or a place. Usually, first thing first is the priest has to go a new one of this, okay, and take it to whatever that place to have liturgy, to have the liturgy at least, before you build anything. Because that's, that's the most, that's what basically given the authenticity of the church before you're building it. Or even even when it's built, it or when it's built and everything, just to make sure that uh, basically it's still uh, uh, authentic and it has the blessing of the bishop. Because in the end of the day, the bishop, the the main priest is the bishop, and we as priests, we are basically representative, or like we're just his hands and ears and you know mouth and, and stuff like this. Uh, so the the main priest is the bishop. Uh, and then we're just the ones that, because he can't be in all these places, we are the ones sent on his behalf um, to represent him and, and do his work. And um, dimension, uh, as we said, means literally instead of the table. All right. The and dimension usually um, contains a relic, normally a part of the body of a saint, which shows that the church is built on the blood of the martyrs. Here we go. I just took it. So in the, in, uh, um, on top of the, one second, on top of, see this here? This is what I'm, this, the next slide is like literally this place right here. And if you notice, there's an opening. And in it, there is a pocket. And in this pocket, we usually put we put an, uh, um, um, a relic of a saint. And what we have here is the relic of Saint, uh, um, of Saint Raphael of Brooklyn, the, the first bishop of the Antiochian Orthodox Archdiocese, if I can say, uh, of America, of North America. So... The, in the pocket, so in the relic is basically, and actually I worked on this one because when this came out, I was still, um, I was the deacon at the Archdiocese, uh, basically. So what we sent them, um, I literally, I'm one of the, one of the th three people that worked on this. We would take, we have a box at the Archdiocese, a reliquary, 
like literally like this one here this one in this picture but much bigger and uh, in it we have literally few bones of saint Raphael. and when i'm talking bones i'm not talking this side bones. we have like six seven inches of like bones and a lot of hair and stuff so what we did we're taking like literally we cut some of those small ones we put them we don't, what we did is we put wax on them and then we basically we covered them with wax and then we insert them inserted them in each of the 300 or 270 ones that we basically uh you know they were made for all the churches in the Asher diocese but every intimation anywhere you go you're going to have one built in here okay usually our church was not consecrated but usually when the church is consecrated right in the middle of the um the altar table before you put this cover usually there should be a hole in here a hole that in it you put a, also a relic relic or multiple relics and then you seal it why the whole point is in the early church churches was literally built on the on the the graves of martyrs literally like and we'll see that in the old country in palestine we see that very often like there's a church where the theotokos is you know is buried uh where do we see you know holy resurrection you know church and not like right on the holy or the holy sepulchral church right on the uh, grave of christ you know so basically that was very common saint so-and-so saint george when he was buried well of course there's a church there that's what usually used to be done but but when we had more churches we had to build more churches the whole concept is like okay that's okay if we're not building it on a uh, um a church on a grave site but at least then let's put a a reminder for us that and we put a relic inside of here and then it's sealed and actually usually um uh with this you know with this hole uh with the relic you put a list of all the current members of the church and the deceased one that came to this church. So usually the parish is asked for every single individual from that church to write every single name of their family members, dead or alive. And then you put them, you literally, you know, you send them to the, to the church, the church kind of like put them all in one document, how, whatever, how many papers, it might take 20 papers, 30 papers, whatever it is. And then you literally fold those papers and you put them in this hole with the relics and then you seal it and it's basically that this church was also built not only with the, the blood of those martyrs but also with the hard work and the dedication of the people you know of the church the people who passed and the people you know who you know were, are actually built at that church now okay or taking care of it all right this is just the general i've been to five or six uh, consecrations of churches it's just a beautiful service it goes it actually it is done uh, usually divine liturgy doesn't matter which day doesn't matter if it's a monday tuesday you know you'll have an ortho service and then right before you start the doxology as we used to on sundays right before the doxology there's this like 40 something minute service that you do and then after everything is washed and it's just, it's just a beautiful service and then everything you you dress the church all in its new covers and everything, then you start the doxology and then you continue with the divine liturgy. But it can be on any given day; it doesn't have to be on a Sunday. Usually they do it on a Saturday or Sunday, just because it's off. You know, people are off and people can more people can participate in that consecration service. Basically, uh, any questions about the altar table? any of these yes tina at least tina the only I, I can only see three people in here because i'm sharing the screen so if somebody else wants to you know either deacon will tell me or you know unmute yourself and ask we don't, we don't have many people on the call anyway today tina. i just i just had a question on the anti mission and the yes and Dementian. okay sure. when that is when you change it to the new metropolitan what do they mm -hmm. do with the old one Usually we have to return all these ones. It's a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. Usually we have to return the old one to the Asher Diocese. And what the Asher Diocese does, either they save them or usually they burn them. Okay. okay. But usually they like to take them back uh, just because you never know some kind of a priest 
pocket it, you know, and I'm sorry, and I'm saying this on, you know, live or like, but sometimes like if a priest at some point makes a big mistake or something and he's kicked out or something, you don't want him to keep, you know, go around saying, well, I have, I have one from the, you know, from the bishop, but how do we know in the end if it's, you know, it has to have the current bishop, but sometimes people might not know. You just, you show them that they're not going to be like, they didn't have to, you know, so it's like, well, I have the intimation from the bishop. Well, it has to have always the, the signature of the current metropolitan. Okay. Yeah. By the way, today I was cleaning um, uh, at the church, cleaning a few things. It's like I, every time I feel like, oh, I'm done. But it's like, oh, no, there's this, still this area. But I really discovered in end dimension, we had one in the church was like tucked in from 1846. 1846. It's still in a great shape because it was covered with some kind of a nail on like a plastic cover. And you can just only say that, you know, it was a, a, a drop of wine on it uh, before they see. And that's why probably they sealed it with this. But it's black and white. It's just us. I saw this. It has Russian uh, signature um, uh, uh, writings. And then in the bottom, some Arabic that says back when Patriarch Gregorius. So 1846, that's how many years? 150 years, 160 years, 170 years. Almost 170 years. I put it on the side and that will be nice to like frame it, do something with it because this is history, people. At least that's on our look, you know. 18... Would they not want to put it in the museum? So at the Antiochian village, maybe? Uh, who said that? Nicolette. Oh, I just, I did, I'm sorry. I, do, I don't know why I didn't re you know, recognize your voice. Why do we want to give it up? It's, it was written for our priest. I mean, it's actually, I forgot, Father George. We'll just keep it. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we'll just keep it. <laughs> no, you can frame it if you oh, have to yeah. give it back or burn it. Oh, my. Well, so so that's the thing. So those one at some point, probably all of the all these old days, somebody should have at least you know returned it or done something yeah. with it. But somehow it stayed. I did find a couple other ones, just not to, like I don't want to reveal everything I saw today. But, <laughs> and you're being recorded. I want to be careful. No. <laughs> uh, but the the point is, in the end, yes, all of these should have been returned, probably yeah. at some point, you know, in history. But when it comes to 1840, like. Yes. No, I was just thinking because the Archdiocese has that museum at the Antiochian village. That's well, all. Yes, but how many people visit that museum? I'd rather our people constantly can see we can do something yeah. like probably put it somewhere, you know. Uh, in the foyer. Somewhere that we can put in the church. Yeah. Uh, and just like people can see it. And at some point, if the Metropolitan says, well, I want it, then okay, take it, you know, I just, yeah. but as long as it's not anymore buried, you know, from yeah. 1846 or somehow, whatever, somebody Amazing. brought it to the church, somebody brought it to the church at some point. Uh, I just can't remember the name of the priest because it says, um, keep, uh, you know, Patriarch Rigorius and his parents, the Metropolitan of that, you know, of the area, I can't remember now. Anyway, it lists a bunch of names from the patriarch, metropolitan, bishop, and then the priest. And it says it was done uh, in 1846. 1846. Or actually, or actually, somebody just probably brought it from the old country. Somebody yeah. like a priest who brought it back as a souvenir or something, or somehow had his hands on it and then just. Uh, but I want to, I was like, oh, we need to frame this somehow, take care of it. Yeah. Yes. Um, that it, so yes anybody else then, i have a different question sure god forbid it gets yes. lost you said yes. you have to have it to perform service yes well i just have to well if this one i don't know i go to church on sunday morning and this thing is not there guess what uh -oh. no one is doing anything I stole it that that was my question <laughs> no one can do anything till i report it to the archdiocese and they send me a new one but before this i have to send them a I think it's three hundred dollar. It cost money basically to make yeah. it. Okay. So uh, they they chose. Yes. Father, another question: uh, yes. Why don't we put it for sale and uh, raise money for the church? 
what do you want to say? This thing? That, no, the one that you found in 1846. <laughs> I mean, who's got, you know, in the Orthodox way? How much are you going to get, you know? You know. That's kind uh, of a priceless item. I, I, will, yeah. I, will, I will start with 500 myself. <laughs> but hopefully we can get like a million or something. We wanted yeah. to get to the I'm, I'm, I'm trying to raise the stake here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but not to give you any ideas of like staining, the, you know, God for not staining, but like hiding it or something. But in the end, this is a, without it, we cannot do anything. This is the authenticity of the church, that it's a authentic church blessed by the Archdiocese and the priest who's there is a representative of the metropolitan and has the right to perform on, it, on you know, these things. It's the same thing when you have, what is it like in the government, you know, judges, reg, um, magistrate, or what is it called? Um, uh, you know, you know, some people who have representative who, you know, they're assigned by the government to do something on behalf of the government. It's basically, that's that's our ID, if I can say, the church ID. Um, okay, uh, any other questions? So- Yes, you, Sabuna. Yes, oh. tell me, tell me. Tell uh, me. Uh, on the building, um, yeah. above, I've been to churches, above the altar table when it's built in the circular dome. Mm. I've witnessed where they honor the actual, uh, yes, above, yeah, right on the dome. Okay. Around it mm -hmm. to honor the priest, his, the churiya, the children. It's written mm -hmm. on the dome. Mm -hmm. Is what do you yeah. mean it's written? Like it's, it's it's hand um, painted around the dome in honor for the good health of, for example. Oh, I see. Well, that's not something usual nor like okay. traditional. Okay. Sometimes they do, you know, we have even like the name of the main donor. Uh, sometimes even we see, like if you go to uh, St. Mary's in Baltimore, Mm -hmm. and it's a little bit weird if you go in the altar they have yeah. all kinds of you know it's all you know at least the altar is all uh, uh, painted in icons um, yeah. there there are all the apostles the 12 apostles and then there is a building on this side of the, mm -hmm. of the church and in it if you look there is a guy kind of like like his, like um, sticking his head out and as if yeah. like looking at the apostles and I told Father Damascus I was like who the heck is this guy just like yeah. this and he's like, that's the uh, iconographer himself. Some of them, that's how they sign it. Wow. Yes. At St. Peter and Paul, they don't have the face, but what they've done, you'll see in the altar, this altar or this church was painted by so-and-so iconographer. So sometimes you might see this, but it's not a traditional thing to see yeah. like this. Some people like to like, oh, they, they want to sign it. You know, it's like, fine, whatever. But it's not typical. It's not something like that's what we're supposed to do. Usually, uh, depending on high, how high the church is and how much space you have, you what you should have is the pandocrat or the, the dome with Christ mm -hmm. and angels. Yeah. Okay? And then another row of the Old Testament prophets, male yes. or female. And then under it, the apostles. And then uh -huh. under it, the four evangelists. So yes. it's kind of like you're going Christ, angels, Old Testament, New Testament with, you know, apostles and disciples and evangelists, and then the people. You know what I mean? So yes. that's what you usually see. But like to sign you yes. know, names and stuff. The entire circular portion of the dome yeah. under the, apostle, the dome nefsa yeah. al it's all in a circular honoring the existing priest that I'm watching, his name, Al Khuriya, his grandchildren, and his children. Wow. This yes. is very unusual, I would say. That's what I thought. I meant to ask you that when I when just, I came back. Just not just so I don't say another word. I will say just unusual. Yes, I thought so. Thank okay. you. 
uh, you might have writings, like usually you might have some writings from the Old Testament verses, either Psalms or Proverbs or something like uh, heaven, have, you know, something related to like how glorious are thy work, O Lord, or something like, you know, some verses from the Old Testament, but not like, you know, this thing, you know, you know, thank you for so and so for all of this. So it's like in huge letters. So everybody sees that and is like, oh, this thing was built on this time of this priest or something, you know, it yeah. just, God bless them, whoever did it at a specific place, but it's not the common thing to do. Okay. Um, very, well, very uncommon. Common. Very uncommon. Um, the end mission, where are we? Okay. Also on the altar table, there is what's called the tabernacle. Tabernacle. And here are a few pictures on this. Tabernacle is this thing right here. See, like kind of like a shape of a church. You see it as a kind of like a shape in a church. And here you see like a door, kind of like a, there's a, a, a small, you know, opening. I mean, a, a door that you can open in it. Actually, let me read it and then I'll show. Um, uh, often in the shape of a church building, which is a repository for the gifts of Holy Communion that are reserved for the sick and the dying. So in it, there's a small box that you put uh, the reserved uh, 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 sacraments. So on Holy Thursday, on Holy Thursday, I make two lamps. There's a liturgy on Holy, Saturday, Holy Thursday morning, and the priest makes two lamps, literally two things. The one we do on Sunday, the usual thing that we do, but we do an extra one. And this extra one, after it's done, we are, you know, the clergy, priest and the deacon, deacons will take it apart. We'll take it apart in small pieces and we save them in the box in here. So God forbid somebody's dying. God forbid somebody's going to a major, uh, um, has a major, major uh, uh, operation and it's just very serious and the person might lose his life. Want to make sure that they take communion before this. This is what I go grab a piece. You know, I have a basically what's called a hospital kit where I can serve, I mean, save some, and then go to the hospital or to the house and give the person communion, okay? And that's what we save them in here. Now, ours, it's a little bit small, doesn't fit everything we had, you know, when we made one on Holy Thursday. So that's why I have this box that I just, that's what should be in there, I have them in this box. And the reason I have a lit candle is just to appreciate and show, like, you know, you put in light in front of something very blessed and very precious. So we put a candle in front of it just to burn like, like we do in everything. Um, anything precious that you put, you know, you know, in front of the icon of Christ, we, you know, it's the light of Christ, just to represent at least it's, uh, it's the light, it's the way to get, you know, you know, it's the way for us for our salvation. Okay, but that's technically the tabernacle. Tabernacles can come in very different shape. If you just put Orthodox Church tabernacle, you might get 5 million pictures of that. Same way it's like you would never see, I mean, one second, I don't know why this escape. okay. Like, are all the churches look alike? No. Look how many church buildings, different church buildings and stuff. Same thing with the tabernacle. Some of them you might buy for like $400. Some of them might buy for like Literally, I'm not exaggerating, $25,000, $30,000. Just the way they're made, how big it is, the materials they're made with, you know, some like real silver, real 24 karat gold, you know, do we really need a $30,000 or a fifteen? dollars No, but like some people, like if a church can afford it, why not? It's for the beauty of the church. But as long as the church is helping doing other things, not just spending money on, you know, Stuff like this, you know, with that much, you know, with that much money. Um, okay, so we can try, I'll try to, you know, go a little bit faster with the oblation table. So the next part is what's called the oblation table, the, the prothesis in Greek, or the table where we prepare the, you know, the bread and wine. And in our church is this corner. It is this thing here in this closet. We have a a little bit different situation than other churches, but it is what it is. That's what we have. It is kind of like in this closet. And then we can get, um, 
closer, boom, boom. So this is it. This is where I prepare the, you know, the lamb, you know, on Sundays, at least or any time I have a liturgy. Um, okay, so when we open it, when we open this closet, this is what we see. We have the chalice where we put the wine in the water. See this, uh, I, it needs to be filled, but this one is has... Um, you know, wine in it. This one has water, and this is where we mix in the chalice. And then this is what's called the discos, where I put the actual bread on it. Okay, this is just an extra chalice, just whenever we have more people, you know, so we can more, you know, um, me and the deacons can give communion. So, oblation table. As we face the altar area, the table of oblation on which the bread and wine are prepared for the liturgy stands on the left side of the altar table, it's always on the left side. You would never, you would never see this somewhere here. It's just not. You might see it here. You might see it even actually on the side here, like depending on the shape. But it's always on the left side of the church, of the altar, never on this side. Okay? So you might see it sometimes in churches. You might see literally like in pizza oven. If you're familiar like a kind of a pizza oven like right here, you know, in the wall. Some, some of them have it this way. Some of them might have the pizza oven right here. Some of them might have a table. You know, so we have a closet. We have our reasons because we deal a lot with, you know, we're in D.C. We deal a lot with um, uh, mice and, you know, rats and stuff. So we want to make sure things are, um, uh, things are protected. Okay. Uh, I do want, I'll be very honest with you. It is very small for me, and it's just, I have like half an hour at least here of work every time. Uh, and then with the, you know, and then we have to finish the, uh, uh, um, anyway, at some point, I do want to change it. And I want to put some kind of a, a shelf, like a white shelf or like a table. Um, and then under it, basically like a cabin where we can save the stuff, but like I have more space and more things that I can put on the table whenever we do an liturgy. So I have more space. So we have a few options and just trying to get the best option we can without costing us a fortune or anything. So either a shelf that we just like hanging on the wall here or on the wall here, um, but like a white shelf, like 20 inch at least. And then under it, some kind of a, like a closet to store things in them when we're not using them. Anyway. At some point, um, the chalice, the cup of the the chalice, right there. Uh, the cup for the wine and the discos. This one is just the plate. Just it's a plate, circle like a round plate, in which uh, the round plate, elevated on a stand for the bread, are kept on this table. These vessels are normally decorated with iconographic iconographic engravings, Christian symbols, and the sign of the cross. You might see some, you know, cross sign here. It some have some engraving. Usually, this one here around this, it will say, "Take it. This is my body, which is shed for you for the remission of sins." What the, usually the priest says when he's blessing the the bread. It just sometimes. Um, on this table, there is also a special liturgical knife, symbolically called the spear, right there. You might have a different shape, but usually this kind of like a triangle kind of shape. That's the one we have at the church. And in this one, this is what I cut the bread with, communion and everything. Okay? This is one when I prepare, you know, the, the, the lamp and put it here. This is what I use. I use this, what's called the spear. All right? Uh, which is used for cutting the Eucharistic bread and a liturgical spoon for administrating Holy Communion to the people. Okay, those are the spoons that we use for communion. And then, of course, the, the under it is the cloth, you know, to put it under so we don't spill things. And if anything, that there. And by the way, I forgot to give you, and um, Rose, I, I forgot to yes. give you. It's okay, Sunday. Sunday, inshallah. So, um, there are also special covers for the chalice and discos and a cruciform piece of metal called the star. So this is the crucified, uh, cru uh, how, is it, how did he say it? A sponge, what is it? 
there are special covers. A cruciform piece. This is a this is a cruciform piece. And it's basically why, because we covered those. We covered the discos and we covered the um, the uh, the chalice. So we put covers and the covers are, here they are. So see this thing that was on top, like a, as a shape of a, a star, that's how you can actually fold it. And then these things, one covers the, the, the discos, the plate, one covers, so there's one that covers this thing, one that covers the chalice itself and then the bigger one there's another cover that covers everything and if you notice this thing that covers everything usually look at deacon at the deacon archdeacon work in it or deacon nicola's back whoever is holding the discos it's going to have this kind of cloth on his back on his shoulder just keep that in mind next on sunday and that's what basically the bigger cloth that covers both of these two Okay, usually there are prayers anytime. I mean, that's why when Deacon Nicola comes in the morning on Sundays, him and I usually we do all these prayers. I like to put the, this thing on top of the lamb, there's a prayer, and then this, and then you know, all of the you know, there are prayers for everything. So it takes us usually a solid hour to prepare everything in the morning on Sunday, and also depending on the names of the people that we have to pray for. Um, a sponge and cloth for drying the chalice after the liturg liturgy are also usually kept here. Usually, um, I'm not using a sponge just because we're only doing once and I clean it very well, but usually you put a sponge in it, in the chalice, when you're not using it, just to make sure that it absorbs everything. It's not letting any, everything is dry. But if you notice, when we open this, I told you there's the sponge here. This one is what helps me to clean this and like clean the discos. After I'm done giving communion, so I don't, in the end, you want to avoid touching things with your hand. So you have the sponge to like clean the discos from all the leftovers of communion and dump them all in here. So that's this sponge is just like to clean take the moist out in all of these things okay above the table of oblation the table on which the gifts of for holy communion are prepared here okay uh which stands in the altar area on the left of it one might find various icon so in our church what do we have we have the icon of christmas nativity of christ you know usually that's the icon but we might actually see this icon some churches, instead of the nativity, and this is more the traditional one. And what is it? Oops, sorry, sorry. And what is it called? Extreme humility. Because here's the king of God. I mean, the king of all, God of all, the creator of all. And he's being slaughtered, basically. And being the sacrifice for us. Instead of him saying, oh, I'm going to kill you all. Or I'm going to sacrifice you all for my sake. You know, he is the one who, was, who became the victim. So it's the extreme hum humility. That's the more traditional one that we see. Nothing wrong with this, but there is just, it's a, it's a newer interpretation of what communion is. And that's why we might see the icon of uh, uh, Christmas, nativity of Christ. But older tradition have this kind of, uh, had this kind of an icon. Okay, any questions on this, on the oblation table? Uh, Father, one one thing, uh, those who don't have a video, I can't see you when you want to uh, have a question, either you raise your hand or you turn it on so I can see you, uh, would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. You are welcome. Uh, the next one is what's called the iconostasis. The iconostasis is the wall, this is it. This is the wall that separates basically the nave where we are in the altar. Iconostasis literally means the wall of icons. Wall of icons. Uh, they are the witnesses. Well, the, you know, um, uh, what is the icons? They are the witnesses of the presence of the kingdom of God to us, and so of our own presence to the kingdom of God in the church. It is the orthodox uh, faith that icons are not only permissible, but are spiritually necessary because the word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
Christ is truly man, and as man, truly the icon of the invincible, invin, invisible God. So, anyway, our churches, like I said, traditionally from day one, in a way, if I can say, when they have started to be established, it's all built with iconography. That's why you see a lot of this kind of like new, this, you know, new um, wake up, if I mean like a wake up call kind of like whenever you have new churches now being built, it's like no iconography, like putting the whole church into iconography, it's something very important. And it's something like part of the, the way, you know, you do the church, not only just like hanging icons on the walls, actually building the whole church with icons. Uh, the icons on the Royal Gate, this one, the Royal Gate, okay. A witness to the presence of Christ's good news, the gospel of salvation, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just, you know, so it's like the gate, you know what I mean? Like, how do we know about Christ? Oh, through these people. So as if like they have the door who taught us who Christ is, who brought the news to us. Sometimes you'll see in some of the churches, you'll see the annunciation icon in the middle. And then the, the four disciples on the corner of the icon of, uh, um, uh, on, on, on the you know, on the sides of the icon, because, oops, when it comes to the shape of the iconostasis, there are trillions of shapes. Here's, look, none of them look the same. It just, they might have. Oh, well, they're going to have a lot of things in common, but. Look, it's just all kinds of different styles. Look at this one, how high it is. Look how this, this one is, you know, how high this one is. But look one, look this one, how just few icons and some hanged on from the wall. Just all kinds of different things. Uh, the four evangelists who recorded the gospels uh, appear and often also an icon of the Annunciation, the first proclamation of the gospel in the world. Over the doors, we have the icon of Christ's mystical supper with his disciples. We have it in our church instead. Well, we have it right here, actually. Uh, so let me just see the Last Supper. Uh, the icon of the central mystery of the Christian faith and the unity of the church in the world. It is the visual witness that we too are partakers in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, that we are. Da, 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 da. Over and around the central gates are icons of the saints. So this is the beautiful gate or the royal gate. And around it, you're going to have different things. But there are three main ones you're going to see in every single Orthodox church in the world ever, all the time. You're always going to have Christ icon here. Always. There's no Orthodox church you're going to walk in and somehow they have saint, some saint here. Always Christ here. Always. Always Mary, the Virgin Mary on this side. Always. Always Saint John the Baptist come here. So those three are like, that's it. I mean, there's no playing around with this. The fourth one, this one here, it is always, always whoever the church is named after. So our church is named after St. George. Who's here? St. George. Our sister parish, um, St. Peter and Paul, Christ, Theotokos, St. John. Who do they have here? St. Peter and Paul. St. Mary's in Baltimore. It's the nativity of the Theotokos. So guess what? Jesus. Mary, like this, standing or, you know, holding Christ at some point. And then St. John the Baptist. And what is here? An icon of the nativity of the Theotokos. You go to St. Let's give you an example. St. John of Damascus Church. Well, Jesus, Theotokos, St. John, um, St. John the Baptist, St. John of Damascus. So if I walk into a church, I have no idea. I didn't see the sign. I missed the sign that says which church who is named after, all I have to do is what? Go to this site, to the icon next to the Theotokos and read what it says on it. And by then I would know, oh, this is St. George. Then the church is named St. George. Okay, that's how we know uh, the name of the church. Any questions about 
uh, the iconostasis. Now, you tell me with the other ones, it's a free range of whatever you need, whatever you want to put on it. In here, we put St. Elias. Somebody loved, you know. In here, we put Annunciation. Here, we put some of the disciples and apostles, depending on how big the wall, depending how much space, depending how big you want it. Like I said, you can do whatever you want to do here. Again, like we showed, uh, like I showed in, uh, in this, it just can be walls of icons, walls of whatever you want to put in here. Okay. Sir John, I have a question. Yes. Or Rose also hears that. Okay, yes, Angela, yes, tell me. Do all of the Orthodox churches have the same, set the icons up the same way? Because I was in a Carpatho Russian Orthodox church and they and it was set up differently. Even, well, again, Christ, Theotokos, uh, St. John the Baptist, and the patron saint of the church, this is a, like, I mean... That's that's how it should be. Anything else, like it's a free range. But if you're telling me like there was no Jesus here, or the Theotokos is not here, that's uh, I would really like to know why they did this. Jesus and the Theotokos were there, but instead of John the Baptist, they had the angels there. Well, okay, that's what. I, if it's a very small church, that there's no way they they need a door to go in. So that's why we see what we see in our church. Oh, I have to plug in my ear. But what do we see here in the door to go in? An angel. And then an, an angel here because those are the door that takes us inside. So yes, and probably I should have mentioned that. If it's a very, very small church, that there's no way you can make anything, like make way, um, you know, to have another one, then you, I guess you have to sacrifice with one of them. But like to have... so. Would it like is there a door here and then bunch of icons next to it on this side too? I don't remember. I have to go back and look at the picture. But it's it would be very weird if they don't have it this setting if they have the space for it, of course. Rose, you're next. Thank you, Deacon. The Abuna, the two archangels, are they yeah. not also stationary? In terms of the entrance and the exit, the archangel Michael, the arch, or no? no. I mean, angels, or sometimes you'll see deacons. So St. Romanos oh. uh, or St. Stephen. Uh, but usually either angels or one of some of the deacons who, you know, saints, deacons. Oh, so, okay. God willing, in 300 years, in 200 years, Deacon Nicola, we might even, you know, God, you know, you know, Deacon Nicola on one side and Archdeacon working on the other side. Inshallah. Then Nicola. Uh, fa yeah. Father, I'm going to be a doormat. Uh, for <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm saying is, it's. As long as I make it, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but you know what I mean? So, usually, uh, yes, angels, but also there is the upper, you know, the possibility, and you might see um, also uh, deacons. Okay, Rodaina okay. is next. Rodaina, go ahead with your uh, question. Uh, no, I don't have any question. I'm oh, just... <laughs> I'm just laughing at... <laughs> okay, no problem. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. All right, you will. I have a question. Oh, yeah. Go, go ahead, Rola. Oh, Rola. Uh, Abuna, like I never saw deacons, picture of deacons on the doors. When? And we church all the time, Archangel Michael and Arch Arch Archangel Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I heard too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is very, very common traditionally to also have deacons. So um, a lot of Greek churches have that, even a lot of Antiochian churches. In our area, I'm not familiar with, but if you... Um, uh, you have you been to Denbury? Yes. Saint uh, Nicholas and Saint Nicholas and Denbury. No, Denbury Saint George, Saint George in Denbury. No, which one is in De Saint? Uh, not Bridgeport. Not Denbury, Bridgeport. Bridgeport. Yes, thank you. Bridgeport. Saint Nicholas. Saint yes. Nicholas. Saint Nicholas and Bridgeport. They have uh, the um, uh, the deacons. 
Uh, I've been to a bunch of bunch of Greek churches that they have deacons. The You're saying they're actual deacons? Il best away will the current deacons? No, no, no. I'm joking. Saints. Maybe that example. <laughs> Saints. Saint Romanos, Saint Stephanos. Oh, okay. Even, you know, that's why I'm like, I'm saying, God willing, in 200 years, you know, uh -huh. he will be a saint. Like Deacon yeah. Nicola, <laughs> Father, you cut me short already by, by a century. <laughs> You know, 200 years from now, when the church comes, you know, uh, you know, acknowledge uh, De uh, Saint Deacon Nicola of DC, you know, then, you know, God willing that we can have his, uh, you know, uh, icon on the door. But really? it's, um, yeah. Yeah. It's like, this is the first time I heard that there is no Archangel and Gabriel. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a meaning called as uh, Arch Arch Archangel Michael and Gabriel at the doors. Well, because that's what I heard too. That uh, what are the, the deacons are referred to as angels? Priest is the Christ, basically, or the bishop and the priest are Christ, and then the deacons because this these are their doors. Deacons cannot go in and out in here. Yeah, they cannot. So where no. do they go? These doors. So that's why you have the deacons, either deacon icons or angels. But at the end of the day, this is the like deacons who represent angels because because deacons represent angels thank you we learned a new thing today yeah thank you you're welcome that's what i get paid for <laughs> god bless um okay where we're let's uh, keep going so again the walls i mean here how big and how high it is the sky is the limit and then whoever you want to put saints you know in my home parish in Lebanon, uh, they have we have seven churches. So they have on the iconostasis on both sides, the saints who are the patrons of the other churches. Sometimes what they do, it's like oh the you know the donor the you know the donors who donated the money for it. So it's like they're patron saints, okay, um, you know so or major saints in our lives. Like there's no Greek church you're gonna go to, even if it's not named after St. Demetrius, which is like 80% of the churches, you're gonna have St. Demetrius on, on here. You're gonna have St. Constantine and Helen on here, just because they're common saints, like well-known saints in, you know, in the Greek church. And in, in Antioch, we're very familiar with St. Tacla, St. Ignatius, of course, St. George, even if the church is not named Marilies, St. Elias, these are common. so but again as long as these three in their place and this one here is the patron uh saint of the church and then anything else sky is the limit um do, 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 do. in recent well this is a good you know point that i'm gonna in recent centuries the iconostasis in most orthodox churches became very ornate and developed into a virtual wall Dividing the faithful from the holy altar rather than uniting them with it. That's very interesting the way he says this in the book. In recent years, this development has happily been altered in many places. Then you can tell Karesha's soul when he feels, Father Hapko, what he feels about huge walls of icons that kind of like you can see, you cannot see anything in the inside. Um, Developed into a very, okay. Du, 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 du. In recent years, this development has happily been altered in many places. The iconostasis in many church buildings now gives first place to the icons themselves and has become once more an icon stand or screen rather than a solid partition. So, next time you know you go to St. Mary in Baltimore or you see any of their church you know, services, look at the iconostasis. They built it literally literally it just it has christ saint john the baptist a door like a short door that you can just like literally open it like and you just go in and then here theotokos and the icon of um, the nativity of the theotokos there's a space in between you can easily think see things done in the altar there's still a gate and everything but like there is just like they don't have any of these on top, nothing like this. It's a very, very simple one, which technically that's how it was in the early church. And it kind of developed like with art and all of this, that they just like became like what we I showed you in the pictures, all these kind of like, look at this one, you know, 
There's just a wall of icons. You definitely cannot see anything inside. Okay, because I know it's eight. I don't want to go too long, but I'll, you know that's why. But anyway, any questions? Um, beside the iconostasis, Orthodox Church buildings have the icon of the Theotokos with Christ appearing with her found over the altar area. And if we're going to go back to our church, I'll just tell you where that means. Um, see in this area right here on the wall, usually, you have what's called, well, the icon of the Theotokos, Virgin Mary holding Christ. That's, and usually there's an apse there. And that's basically what you, you know, what you, you know, there's an icon of the Theotokos holding Christ. In our church, we never had, in my home parish in Boston, they never had, and they just literally, um, late, like a few years ago, they just put an icon on the wall of it, like of the Theotokos holding Jesus. You know, it just, but technically, there's always like this kind of icon on the wall on top, like kind of like, you know, on top. Um, in the altar area, it is also traditional to put icons of the saints who compose church liturgies and hymns, usually right here on the walls. If you have all these things like here on the lower, you know, lower level here, usually you have icons of saints, St. John Chrysostom, St. John, St. Basil, you know, the liturgy that we do for him during Lent, St. Gregory, you know, or church fathers, like people who taught us the faith, the, the faith. Uh, directly behind the altar table, there is usually an image of Christ in glory, enthroned or transfigured or resurrection, and sometimes offering the Eucharistic gifts. So the icon of Christ, the Theotokos in Christ as a baby, kind of like in the up. So if you imagine, well, so you see the wall here, right? Uh, the, with the windows we have. Usually instead of the windows, this is where you're going to have the Theotokos with with the Christ, and then here you'll have Christ, either the icon of resurrection in the middle, or the icon of transfiguration, or icon of Christ literally giving communion to his disciples. But that's if you go some churches you might find this. This one it talks about all of these uh, churchy things. Uh, um, on the altar table, we actually have always the cross. There's a whole, a few pages on the cross, or one page in the cross in the book talking, but it's always on the right side here. Um, and we know the sign of the cross. What do those three fingers represent? Trinity. Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And those two, a lot of times people know about this, but they forget about these two. Spiritual nature and human nature. Yes, his full divinity and full humanity, or like the two full uh, nature of Christ, his humanity and his uh, uh, divinity. So Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three and one, and then two, fully human, fully divine, or fully divine, fully human. Okay? Um, vestments, actually, the tr I just wanted just to show you the priest vestments, actually, uh, right here. Uh, the priest vestments, it's not like hiding the face. Those are what's called the cuffs. But uh, the priest vestments, the bishop's vestments are very close. The deacons, it's a little bit less things. Uh, but what we have, they have to, but just in a different form. Um, there are, you know, this, this white thing, this cloth, that's like, that's the first thing that the priest puts on. Okay. Um, uh, it's called stikharion. It's basically the baptismal robe. It's just referred to as this is an acknowledged baptized person doing the, you know, performing um, uh, the liturgy, uh, even before the ordination that he's baptized. Uh, you know, this is just a, and usually in white to show that he is pure, or it's like what he's putting on is the purity of Christ. Um, this, uh, the second part is this, the stole the butter shield, this thing that goes around the neck. Those two, the stikharion, the this garment, and the butter, the, the stole, very important. Those are like base um, in our faith, or at least in our vestments that we have to wear. This one is usually done from wool in the early church. And why is it from wool? Any idea? Connect wool with some with some animal. Lamb. Sheep. 
Lambs. Yes, lambs and sheep. So it's like, you know, the priest is the shepherd and he has to take care of his sheep or his lambs. And what are these tassels in the bottom? The souls. Souls. The yeah, the souls, the people who is entrusted to save. So they have him, he has them around his neck because their life is depending on him and his life, his salvation is depending on the people. Okay? And then we have what's called the uh, 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 the, the belt. And it's honestly it's just to, to hold these things in their place, you know? But we baptized all of these in like some kind of an orthodox way. So now it's just like, well, it's the belt is just like ready to fight. Uh, the cuffs, those things that you see on the head, they're basically the cuffs that goes around the arms. And then the reason they were introduced, you'll see the deacons wearing them and the priests wearing them. It's why it's because, you know, when you're, you know, when you're preparing the, the gifts and stuff, you don't want things, your leaves, uh, sleeves, and if they're big to like knock any of the bread out or the wine or anything. So you put these, but we baptize them in an orthodox way or an orthodox interpretation and saying, you know, you know how like knights, when they fight, they put, you know, some metal things around their wrist so they don't get cut, you know, with the sword. So it's the same thing as if like the priest and the deacons are fighting against evil, but we're not using swords, but we're using, you know, our love, our humility, our uh, sacrifice, you know, stuff like this. We are using the sword, Father. We're using the word of God. It's two-edged sword. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You know what I mean. You know what no, I mean. no, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's it. But um, okay. So, and then on top of everything, this is you know this is the what thing that goes goes on top, uh, and it's basically the name of it. It's Felonian, but like I just want to tell you. Um, um, so this one is. Uh, Developed from the formal garments of the early Christian era under the inspiration of the Bible, came to be identified. Uh, when put in, uh, basically, when when the priest puts this one on, he basically says, "Thy priest, O Lord, shall clothe themselves in righteousness." It's just everything like here's it's, it represents like I'm putting righteousness on me, and hopefully, I live a life of righteousness. And the saints shall rejoice with joy always, now and ever, unto ages of ages. Amen. And this thing that you see here this uh, square thing, like kind of diamond shape, is what the priest at some point after his ordination gets to hear confession. So when you see a priest without it, that means he cannot have, can, cannot hear confession, which that's what happened, you know, that's what I was, or that's what I, you know, I did not have it from August till Palm Sunday. And then now you see me wearing it. Why? Because I have the blessing to hear confession. But this is, um, you know, that's another thing that you might see, at least on the priest. Okay, every single piece that the priest puts on has a special prayers that he has to say. And it represents, every piece represents something. Okay, and my last thing is, um, it's in his, in his uh, first part of his, uh, you know, second book, it's Christian symbols. Uh, the Orthodox Church abounds with the use of symbols. These symbols are those realities which have the power and competence of manifesting God to men, signs which carry us beyond ourselves and themselves into the genuine union and knowledge of things eternal and divine. What are these signs? Candles, incense, the initials and letters of Christ's name. What does that mean? Do you know these four things, what they mean? Jesus, Jesus in Greek, Christos, so Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ, Nika. Nika is like Greek word for conqueror, triumphant, the one who's gonna win, okay? Or the one who's winning. So, Jesus, Christos, Nika. Jesus Christ, conqueror, okay? That's, we'll see that on the lamb, you know? Nancy makes the bread, you know, for us, or whoever is making, you know? There's a whole stamp of this huge thing. And this is what I cut to make the, the uh, you know, the communion for the people. This part goes first. This part, I take it, you know, we, the clergy, commune ourselves from it. And those three, basically, those three, when I cut it, because I cut it like this, and I cut it like this. 
when I when you hear me saying the holy things are for the holy, al Qudusat al Qudisin, when I lift the lamp, what right after I lift it, I break it in four, you know, I break it in four. So there's one piece, two piece, three, four pieces. Divine masters. Exactly. The deacon will say, after I say uh, the holy things are for the holy, one of the deacons will say, well, divide master, and then literally turn them and then divide them into four pieces. But that's okay. Um, uh, anchor, I didn't include in here. Sometimes you'll see in churches anchor. What does it mean? What is the, What does the anchor do? Holds the right the boat doesn't let it you know go all the way, you know Christ is our anchor that's what tokens is you know uh, you might see alpha and omega why the alpha and omega beginning and the end exactly the first letter in the Greek alphabet the last letter in the alphabet okay beginning and the end uh, you might see vine you know peacock sometimes you see peacock why the peacock that I don't know. Very, very simple. It just, it's always referred to as this beautiful animal. Just like this huge beauty, like this beauty that, you know, like what we say um, on Holy, I mean, on every Saturday, the Prokimino, the Lord is clothed or in majesty, uh, but also one of the trans, well, the original says basically in beauty. So it just peacock was always referred to in the Byzantine art. It's like beautiful animal, like with whatever you call the, his uh, tail or whatever, you know. Um, also, what is this? Sometimes you'll see it, um, yes. a, a cross like this. But it's literally, this is the X for Christos. Uh, it literally, it represents the first two letters of Christos. The X, and then in Greek, the letter P, like what we have, the shape of letter P, is in Greek, the same shape, we call it P, they call it R. So this is Christos for Christ. And then why the fish? We see a lot of times the fish. Anybody might know? Not the deacon, of course. Because he was a fisherman. That's one way. It's good. But that's not only it. It's because Jesus, when Jesus did the bread and the fish, it's yes. <laughs> There's more into it. Uh, These are good, good, don't get me wrong. These are like good interpretations. It's like a blessing. The fish is a blessing. It's... Yalla. One more, one more. No, it's because we didn't come from fish. Like so. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two things why we use the fish. Well, what you said, it is totally right. You know, the fish, we see it very evident in the, the New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Christ, you know, or the fisherman, he take fishermen to become his disciples, fishing the fish, you know, giving it, even taking it out of the, uh, basically, you know, God is going to fish. You know, anyway, we're not going to go a lot of theology here. The point is, they were fishermen. Where he did the, perform the miracle of turning the uh, mm -hmm. the two fish to like multiple fish and all, or um, in, uh, yeah. But um, also, in the old days, that was the secret sign of orthodoxy. Oh. So what does that mean? Oh. Um, you, know, you know, they were afraid of persecution. How do I know Nicola Saeed is Christian? All I do on the floor, I'll just go like pretend that I'm just drawing and I'll just make this line like this. Oh, okay, oh wow. This, I remember this, hearing that now somewhere. Just, just this line. And then if Nicola gets the hint and if he's Christian, what is he going to do? Complete the bottom. <laughs> he's just gonna, <laughs> he's just gonna <laughs> finish it like this. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, that's it. That's how we know without like explicitly like, hey, are you Christian? Because well, why are you asking me? Then you're Christian. Then, okay, let me get your head chopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, there's another thing. Um, uh, the word fish in Greek, it's called, I should have spelled it out on the paper. Ichthis. Literally, it's a word. Ich, like e, thesis. So, e, e, s. Ichthis. Five letters. Ichthis. Ichthis. Right? So, but e stands for 
the first letter of Jesus, mm -hmm. Jesus. The second letter is this first letter of Christ. Yeah. So Jesus Christ, th, the th is from Theos, God. I, ich, thi, it's from the word ion, which means son. So Jesus Christ, son of God. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, ich, thi, s, s, sotir, the last letter, sotir, from the word in Greek, um, uh, 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 sotir, savior. So each letter of the letters of the word fish in Greek can be an acronym, if I can. What is, is that? What is it called in, in English? Uh, basically, the first letter of Acronyms. Christ, Son of God, Savior, the Savior, it's basically the first letters of these. If you put them all together, you'll get the name of fish. So it became it became also a sign of, you know, that it, you see a lot of fish in the church, like in art. Okay? Uh, Father, one more comment. Is it yeah. also okay when he called his disciples, he says that you're fishermen, but I'm going to make you fishermen of men? Of course. Of yeah. course. All of these, all of these that you guys said about, uh, you know, they were fishermen and you're going to become fishermen of men. Of course, uh, the, uh, you know, multiplying the five loaves of bread and the two fish, of course. But I do want you to know also these two other reasons that somehow, sometimes we don't, like we're not familiar with, or we're not, we were just, uh, we're not familiar with. So it was the secret sign of acknowledging or recognizing if you're a Christian or no. Yeah. One person will just draw this part. And if I get the hint, I'll just do the second. So if I, so if I get the hint, then it's like, oh, we're both Christians. If I don't, one of us is not, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And because the names, the letters of the word fish in Greek yeah. represent the first letter of Jesus Christ, Son of God, save the Savior. Nice. Okay, so never, now every time you eat a you eat fish, just keep that in mind. You'll say ichthis. Ichthis. Anyway, but I'm sorry if we went too long a little bit. I mean, too too late a little bit today, but um, I just wanted at least to, to try. So next week, God willing, we will have. Um, um, we will have F Father Damaskinos and we will cover, um, uh, you know, the book of Revelation. He oh, is, yeah. he did his master's degree at Holy Cross Seminary in Boston on the book of Revelation, actually on the throne of God in the book of Revelation, which technically he's going to relate it to the altar table, the altar in the divine liturgy and try to explain to us in Awarish. What is the book of Revelation at least for us? Like a general introduction for it. Okay, so God willing, next week, that's what we will do. Any questions, anything? Any business we need to take care of? Uh, Salim, uh, go ahead. You're muted, Salim. You still, still muted. muted. You're still muted. Although, well, technically, we don't see the mute sign, but you're muted. Somehow we didn't hear you. He says, I'm okay. <laughs> he says, you okay, thank it? you, Salim. If you want to type it or... Okay. Well, you can chat if you want. Yeah. Uh, Anybody else? Everything else? Everything under control? Yep. Okay, well. Um, Salim, are you right in? What is no. it? No, he's not. Uh, well, God bless you all. Well, I don't, you know, between... Uh, I know Auntie Rosalie, Rudina. Well, now I see Rudina. <laughs> Nicolette, Rose, and um, uh, Rula. God bless Rula. you. Because I, I just don't, I mean, anyway. But uh, huh? here's the uh, Wali too. Oh, here's Rose. <laughs> and Nicolette, we just heard. Oh, here's Nicolette. Wake up, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Abuna thought you know. we were sleeping, weren't you? <laughs> oh, well, even if you slept, even if you were sleeping, I still appreciate that you came in. And I totally, <laughs> understand, I totally understand after all the work that you guys done today to do. To. No, no, not at all. And I think when you move the screen, it it turns you off on the video, at least mine. Like, I want to see who's in the room. Mm -hmm. 
I it just turns me off. Yeah, I don't know why. Okay. Yeah. If if you hover over the chat or where the video and you can move it back and forth, you know, yeah. it, it will minimize it or enlarge it for you. I see. Once okay. you have the full view, so. We're still getting text savvy, but thank you, Abuna. Allah Allah Allah, do we have any homework for our next Sunday? So, I mean, next uh, Thursday, so we don't, uh, so we can Let's, sound like we're a little informed. I would, I would just read the revelation, uh, you know, chapter that, or the, the few pages Father Hapko has, just to have, you know, an idea. And I think Father Damaskinos, um, we'll go a little bit more into like more in depth, not too much because we can have session like a whole day on this. Uh, but I would just read, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to tell you, oh, read the book of Revelation by next week, but at least read what Father Hapko has. So you'll have that's the beauty of his series that at least the important things, like the, the main things, the major ideas that you need to know. So when you um, when Father Damaskino speak about, speaks about it, at least you have some kind of an idea. But I'm sure with what he's going to say, even if you have, you don't have any idea about it, you're still going to. Uh, Father, is he planning to be that his only session or he's planning on uh, coming back for us if we have uh, other questions uh, for him to address? So I, I was just planning on having one. I okay. think what we, I mean, if we really feel like, I was thinking at least he can maybe do like 45 to 50 minutes, you know, and then leave like 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes of questions. Okay. And if we really feel like we really need to, you know, meet again for it, why, why not? I'm sure he won't have a problem. Okay. Thank you. Know, you. It's, it is going to be because it is very... Um, yes. I want to say intimidating, but it's just like in a way it can also get confusing. And what does that mean? Is this really what's going to happen? How do, how literally how little literal we need to take that book, and how much can we take it? You know what it's, it really says, but it, what but what but is it symbolic? Is it like because even like and when we talked, I forgot to mention that point when we talked about you know, heaven and hell are we never actually Christ says. It is this. He'll say it's like mentions. It's like this. So is the Revelation book something, you know, also we have to interpret it as like, it's like as if this going to happen. Or, you know, so using terms at least humans can understand. Well, we got we got one of the experts on this, Father Damaskinos, that, you know, he can walk us through this, try to explain to us at least the orthodox view on it. As we say in Arabic, even uh, how, how would you address, how would you translate this in English? Chris, here's a little <laughs> translation for this. Give your bread or your whatever the ingredients to make bread to, the, to a baker, even if he's going to charge you a lot, or even he's going to charge you half what he's going to make for you. Or if he burns <laughs> half of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why he's no, the baker. Yeah, the <laughs> yeah. well, well, the <laughs> point is, whatever he's going to give you, even if he gives you, give whoever is the professional. Let the professional do their job, do, do his job because he's going to do whatever job he's going to do. It's going to be great, even if it's a five, five minutes. They're going to be a fruitful five minutes of something. And you know, Father Damaski knows that's what he spent two years of his life studying. Beside, at least the but at least. This one was like two, you know, I think it's like a, a hundred page, I think at least, or 75 to a hundred page um, dissertation on, you know, the book of just the throne of God in, in the book of Revelation. Wow. One aspect of, you know, the yeah. book. But anyway. uh, Father, for everybody, Rula says, thank you, Abuna, and all I have yeah. believed. So. God bless her. God bless her. We appreciate that. Yalla, sure. Like, like Walid, like he, just, he didn't open his mouth the whole session. He's, like, <laughs> he, 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 he's busy eating, Father. <laughs> he's saying hello. <laughs> now no, we're humans. We right away think about the bad things. Oh, then, you know, so him it's going awesome. like this, he's saying stop. Yeah, you yeah, tell me I that was saving a child's life down the street and all that. We get, we get the... <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Allah. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. More honorable than the cherubim and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Thou who without corruption bears God the word in our truth, Theotokos, we magnify thee. Yaman hea kram in the cherubim, where for homage than Mirai Kiasim in the seraphim. Yaman Mirai Fasad and Walladat Kanimat Allah, Hakan and Nikwal the Tilla, he can of them through the prayers of our holy fathers. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen.